Hi, my name is Patricia Wellinson, and this is Harvest Cornucopia Project. Um, we're going to paint this using some fast and fun techniques. Um, it's not real, real hard, and I show you how to kind of break it apart where it gets a little tricky. Um, I always am about using easy techniques. This is painted on an anyway tray, um, and we call it an anyway because you can um, just change out these panels. You can flip this panel over and paint on the back side, and um, so it makes it very versatile, very affordable. You can just replace the panels for multiple seasons, and it's big enough to actually, here's like a mug, it's big enough to actually put like, you know, a whole plate and glasses on. You could serve wine and cheese and all that kind of stuff um, at your house. You can make these um, panels into um, placemats as well. So you could have, or you can make them into centerpieces. So there's a lot of things that you can do with the piece. This is sized exactly so that you could paint it on, well, it's not sized, 200% sized up will um, allow you to paint that on a floor cloth. And I think that this project would be a brilliant floor cloth for, you know, in front of the kitchen um, sink or whatever like that. So, um, and we've used um, a lot of really neat new tools. So you'll want to at least stick around to watch how the tools work out. We've got banding tools and check tools and that kind of stuff and as well as background words, which were a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoy the project, and let's get started. When I'm getting ready to paint a project, I first have to choose my surface. And this project was really, really tough because this is the Anyway tray, and this is a really lovely um, wood tray that you can actually pop this insert over, out, and then flip it over and paint both sides. So it's a multi-purpose thing. You can have the season on one side and then every day on the other side. It's really, really a compelling, very popular surface. But then you go in and the Anyway tray converts completely, um, it's like 200% to convert it into a floor cloth pattern. And we've got this super duper heavy non-fraying um, rock lawn that is uh, meant for this kind of application. And so I could expand it 200% and I could have a floor cloth easily. So I could paint it on that. And then when you see where we're going, then I have a, um, a table runner rock lawn. And I thought, oh my gosh, I just want to do all the things. So when we were getting ready for our materials, we went ahead and had them done in all the sizes. So we've got our background words, which we're going to do a really dreamy kind of background word thing. This is for the anyway tray size, but wouldn't it be fantastic to take this and put it on your um, your table runner or in the background on your floor cloth. And it even comes in a bigger size than that. Okay, and then we also had the word done in the two sizes. So you could do it on the anyway tray or you can do it on the, um, on the floor cloth. So we are prepared for all the things. And the line art for both is already pre um, sized in the pattern packet. So you're good to go whichever way you decide you want to paint this project. Alright, when you're getting ready to prep your, your surface, you want to go ahead and choose like the fastest way. In my opinion, prep is the part I don't like to do the most. So I'm going to use a sponge of one kind or the other because our large brushes are only that big and you can see that big on the surface is going to take me a while. Um, with If you're using one of the mushroom sponges, then because it has this handle on the back, you can just dip in your paint and it keeps your hands out of the paint. If you have regular sponges or base coat sponges, you might want to put a nitrile glove on. That's going to protect your hands and you won't have to scrape all the paint off of your fingers. Or in the case of the roller, you're just going to roll right on into the paint. Now to make a shortcut, you always do want to seal your surface. So I'm going to use multi-purpose sealer, but to make it faster, I'm going to use burlap and multi-purpose sealer in the same step. So what I'm going to do is just roll into both. And you want to be careful um, not to roll quickly if you have clothes on that you don't want to have damaged. Okay, and then you'll just go ahead and give it that first coat. And because you have a little bit of your burlap mixed in, it's going to give you your first masking coat, and then you don't have to wait for it to dry more than one time. If you need to base coat and then wait for things to dry, then you want to protect your sponge so that you can just rinse it out. You're going to just use a clear baggie, um, and you can do that with the bigger sponges as well. You want to make sure to keep all the air out because it's the air that oxidizes the paint that makes it dry. So air, that's why paint inside a bottle doesn't dry, is because there's no air in there. And then when you're all done base coating, then what you can do is just go to the sink, and this is when I would definitely use my glove, is I would go to my sink and then you just squish the, the roller out under running water, 
and then just let it run until it's clear, but make sure you're squishing. Never use soap because then you'll just end up with a very soapy sponge and you'll end up with bubbles on your project. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and spritz my surface with a little bit of water. I've just rolled on my um, next layer of burlap and then I'm gonna roll those two together and it'll create a little bit more moist. I've got heaters running because it's winter time. It'll create a little bit more moist background or environment and hopefully it'll stay wet longer. Okay, so we're gonna take some cocoa and we're going to just kind of go out here in this netherlands out here in this region. And we're gonna take our um, oyster beige more towards the middle. Okay, we wanna kind of put that in there. I'm trying to decide if I'm gonna to want to um, roller slip slap or just regular slip slap. I think I'm gonna roller, so I'm just gonna place color around. Don't want it to get too yellow. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna roller slip slap into my colors. I'm backing up, I'm squinting. And we wanna just blend these colors together. We want the background wet while we're doing this because we want the um, khaki or the burlap color to mix with the background color. Okay, when we get that outer edge where we like it, then we'll start walking into the middle. Let's see where I can hold on to this thing. And we'll need some more of that. And we'll walk that out into the outer edges. It's kind of just like a little dance. I don't like just base coated flat backgrounds. It's not my style. I like things a little bit wombly. Okay, I'll roll off on there and I'll bring in just a little bit more and maybe now I'll start my slip slap dance with this. Bring that in just on my toe of my brush, flipping it around. Bring some of that through the middle, just so it's not just one light color in the middle. I'm gonna make everybody a family, you know. Flip it around so I get the good angle. And start bringing it in. And you're gonna change your direction. Don't be stroking all in the same direction. Yeah, and that spritz of, uh, of water just really helped keep everything open a little bit longer. Okay, and I think we'll call that done. Just a little bit more out here on the edge. I don't know what I'm going to end up with as far as um, trim and border yet, so um, I might just go ahead and bring this, draw this in just a little bit. Because I more than likely will take out a lot of this edge. And so my new edge will be this other, but I can float that in too. All right. Okay, the nonstick mats are a real lifesaver when it comes to keeping your painting organized and making sure that you don't have a bunch of stuff that can loosen and get on your project. The way you clean them is you just mist it with some water wherever you've got your paint, and then you just scrape with a little handy scraper. It's got little rounded edges, so you're not gonna cut into your mat. So that just loosens everything off, and I'll tell you, this is a magical nonstick mat because hot glue gun doesn't stick, um, two-part epoxy doesn't stick, it just makes a film and you can peel it right off. Um, nothing sticks to this. Um, tape doesn't stick to it, which could be a problem because uh, sometimes I need to tape it down. So I have to be cautious of that. But really handy for just keeping your area clean. Okay, this is a technique that I like to do a lot and I use it often. Let me tell you about this dome brush. The dome brush is a, um, it's a really heavy bristled um, 
like natural bris bristle brush. And when you very first get it, it's going to be just a little bit kind of floppy feeling. So when you're doing your dry rubbing technique, after you like have rubbed the tip off of it a little bit, um, you can see some of my bristles are shorter here. You just want to be really aggressive at rubbing, especially when it's new, so that you can get it just that little bit shorter and stiffer. Once you get them broke in, then you'll always go for these ones that have been used quite a bit. And um, you'll avoid these, but you've got to use these too. So use those when you're beginning, and that way you can use these for like maybe the finer techniques, the finer details. They work all the way, but they're nicer when they get all broken. Okay, I'm pretty sure I'm going to put my stenciled words half on here and half on here. Um, I'm checking that out still. But to do that, I need to make sure that I get them on there straight. And here's some stuff to know about stencils. Um, this, these stencils come with a little locating lines that are north, south, east, and west in all the corners. What's neat about that is that's your straight line. That means that's what is going to be level. Now to get it level for us, um, or to get it halfway, I measured my my um, my tray, and this is a T-square ruler. What's neat about T-square rulers is they go and they cinch right up next to let me get you over there, right up next to the edge, and then they hook down. There's like a little bit of a, a drop there, so they hook on the edge so that it keeps you straight and it keeps you level. So now you don't need to worry about a level; you just need to measure. Okay, I've got my Ghost Rider, which is a ceramic leaded pencil that will erase with water, spit, varnish, anything eraser. And then I've measured to nine inches, um, and I think that's my math is right. Let's go check it on the other side and see if that works out. Yep. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is just slide it up, and I'm going to make another line. I'm going to slide it down. I'm going to make another line. So now I've got three little casual lines down the middle that tell me exactly where my stencil needs to line up at. Okay, I'm completely unsure about my colors right now, but I think I know what I want. I decided, I had um, Dustin at the office lay these out side by side, and I didn't like this weight going equal, equal, because then it looks like a repeat, so I'm going to go ahead and just piece together um, a kind of a custom look, because that's what you can do. So now what we'll do with our colors is in the middle we've got to be lighter. Okay, and then the one thing you've got to make sure of is that you keep your lines straight. So do keep everything on the, the nice level line. Okay, and then, so now what I want to do is I want to have light colors in my um, middle area and then darker colors in my other area. I'm going to mix with the base color to um, be able to kind of tone it. So I've got um, pebble plus the burlap, and then I'm going to use Mississippi Mud plus the cocoa or plus the burlap, depending on how this looks. And you really want to rub off all your paint. And these need to be soft and faded, so that's what we've got right now. It's maybe a little too soft and faded. So I'll go just a little bit of burlap and Mississippi Mud. I go, I went Mississippi Mud plus Cocoa, sorry. Okay, so that's what we got. And now we'll just go over here and just kind of play around with the different words. And you know, while I'm thinking about this, a little piece of tape is probably in order for this. just because that way it won't slide when I'm picking up my arm and stuff like that. And so we could do some with just cocoa. Could have to give thanks over here, more cocoa than not. And by swirling like that, they, they end up being much softer. I think I like the idea of going back and forth between cocoa and the Mississippi mud color. And they don't have to be the same all the way through too, so I could go into some of the burlap and just the center areas and make them just a little bit lighter, just a little variable. 
You definitely need to spend time on your paper towels so that you um, get all of the, um, the excess material off your brush. And when we get over to the edge where things are darker, definitely mix in some of your Mississippi mud so that it shows. And like I said, I'm not sure what my borders and stuff are going to go, but I think it's perfectly fine to have some of the words just cut off by... That looks really cool. Yeah, words make me happy. Now you're going to want to peek at your words to make sure that you like them so that um, you don't have to try and line up a stencil again. So make sure that you kind of get done with it before you move your stencil. Make sure you've got all the words too. And you can just make those edge ones be darker. Okay, so I'm going to peek. Decide do I like it? I think I love it. I've got something, I've got gather. See, I've got a whole word missing here. Peek again. Got feast. Bountiful looks a little lonely down here. Okay, I feel good about that. Look at that. That's just really cool. Okay, so now what I want to do is maybe sort of fit this down over here. And you want to make sure you're straight and you don't want to get too crowded. Okay, and I'm using my leveling lines right now. These are really handy. So they're right off the edge and I'm getting kind of even between both sides. And then double check. Okay, and I'll flip my um, stuff over here. You can neutralize that for the middle area. I've got cocoa in with the um, burlap. Let's see if that's even showing. Yeah. And then Mississippi mud. So when you want it darker, go Mississippi mud and cocoa. And don't forget, like our art is going to cover um, over the top of this. And so I don't want Jive Turkey to be super important, so I'll just kind of make him be real light and faint. This isn't quite the Jive Turkey kind of project. Does that fit with the other? Looks pretty good. I'm missing a word down there. Okay, so now we look for, see we've got Thankful Feast, so maybe we move in with Gather can be at the, let's see, what do we want to do? This is where we're going to use the, the uh, see-throughness of our stencil. I think I'd probably better tile this just a little bit. So we'll bring this down to Bountiful. No, we don't want Bountiful. How about this wobble stuff? And I'm liking how this Okay, I got it pieced over here. Now make sure you're painting on the right line. Make sure you change your colors. I think it's more interesting when you have the different colors going on. Oops, yeah, don't go down there. And my bounty word's not going to fit, so I'll have to do something else there. Now 
I'll take a peek. Here. Okay. I'm being a little bit faint over on the sides because I think I'm afraid. So let's go fill it in just a little bit heavier. I don't know how much this is going to matter if one word intersects with the other, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. As I'm getting ready to lay out my pattern, I want to share this yellow tracing paper. It's really cool because it's on a roll. So if you have a really small project, you can just tear off a little piece of it and you don't have to take out a whole sheet from your book. But if you have a long piece or a long project, you can tear it out the same length, the length that you're going to need it. And what's really awesome is it comes in this great big ginormous um, two foot wide version. And what's neat about that, I've got the real super... Um, lots on a roll kind of thing. I think we've got skinnier rolls than this. But um, if you do floor cloths, you just roll this out to three feet and tear it. And it is super duper um, easy to do your pattern, no taping and stuff like that. And I wanted to share, watch, see how bright the white is. And even when you put this on top, see how much that dulls it. Watch how nice and see-through that is. It is just a wonderful transparent um, tracing paper and when you're squinting and trying to work real hard it this makes all the difference in the world it also tears straight in both directions it's got a grain I never knew paper had grain but it has a grain in that direction and a grain in that direction so you can actually get it to tear nice and even when it starts getting to the end of the roll I just kind of give it a little squinch in the corners to keep it laying out flat okay and this is actually how I design a project um, so I traced my surface onto there. And now to get my layout straight and know that my pattern is going to be right, I go ahead and just cover. I just fold it in half, fold it in half again, and you can fold it in as many times as you need in order to make sure that you have um, straight lines and stuff like that. So. I might want to give myself one more for the middle. And then when you undo it, presto changeo, now I have a nice, where's my center, where's my, my three, my two columns, and all that kind of stuff. Now what we'll do is we'll take our, um, I'll use this paper as a window, and I'll lay this out. I already know I want harvest and I already know I want this, but I need to know where exactly I want them. So I will lay this out like this and then I'll trace my, um, my line art um, in the place on my um, surface sized tracing paper that I want it. Okay, I've got a quick little tip for you. If you tear a hole in your tracing paper and tape across it, then your tracing won't wiggle the way that it does when you only tape one direction or the other. And if you want to make it really secure, you can tear another hole on the opposite side. The Triple Threat um, Ghost Rider has the most wonderful, wonderful tool on the end here. So it has a white ceramic lead, a gray ceramic lead, and then a roller ball. And then what makes the roller ball magic is this padded grip. Okay, um, I never thought that I needed one, but boy, I used to cry at the end of all my trace patterns um, because I would death grip the stylus. So this has a little floating roller ball that just glides along. It's like a, an ink pen without any ink in it. And so I can just put my tracing underneath and go to town and I don't ever, never even notice that I am tracing. Yeah, I feel like I've got 85 tips to share today. So I took out this piece of tracing paper, not even paying attention to the fact that it's brand spanking new and look at how strong that line is. So let me show you how to avoid that. First of all, notice what you're picking up. And we'll take a paper towel and we will wipe off the excess um, material off of this piece of tracing paper. Okay, now when we trace our line, we will also trace softer, but this will help. I wasn't pressing really hard. Let's see what that does for us. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Okay, so we're going to do some shading. I've got some base coats done. Let's get you zoomed in here. 
The base coat's done. Um, this inside here is espresso, and then we're going to use a dome brush with soft black. And we're going to, now this will terrify you, but what I want to do is instead of worrying about my boundaries, I want to go ahead and pretend like they don't exist just to make the painting easier until I have to care. So I'll just do a little bit of touch-up base coating to get rid of what I'm about to do. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just scumble right over the edges of things. And you'll notice that I've got some dust kicking up. That's okay. You just wipe it off, blow it off. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and do a shape following deepening of this area back here. It's just much easier to just scumble all over things than to try to shade and float and walk things in and walk things out. Okay, so that gets me a little bit closer and then I'll go in and I'll deepen. not bring it so much up. Okay, and then I'll wash that brush and then just rebase coat my other elements. Okay, so there are some things that can make floating on this little basket here a little bit easier. So number one, we're going to use the right brush. We This is a lot of little tiny areas. So we need to control our floats. So I'm going to use this little short, bright brush. If you notice that this bristle length is about maybe a third shorter than a regular flat. The other thing is, is look at the sharpness of that tip. Okay, so that is those combination of factors is going to give us a lot of control. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to put our paint down here on our palette where we can get to it. I don't want to reach way up here and try blending three-handed. We want to be controlled, so we're going to keep our movements small. Then I'm going to use my squirt bottle and get you on camera and watch what happens to the water droplets as I squirt. I'm almost out of water. Okay, They get bigger and bigger as you squirt on top, and you got to do it on one of these wax papers. So what I can do is when I feel like I need just a little bit of water, I can be like slurp, slurp, and, or if I need a lot of water, I can slurp up a big drop, okay? And then, Secrets of Floating 101 is what we're going to do is every time when we do this, we're going to touch, once we've blended and stuff, we're going to touch on our paper towel just ever so lightly, but we're going to touch on a wet spot. The wet spot is wet and it's going to attract the water in the brush and so it's just going to kind of pull off the excess and it makes for a really controlled lovely float. We're going to do little amounts of paint on our brush and then we're going to blend in this really weird little L shape. Okay, and that's going to keep all the paint like down on the, the brush where it needs to be. Okay, and then we'll come over here onto the piece and we'll see what that looks like. So I'm a little bit dry. Okay, I'll touch on my paper towel, a little bit more paint. And you'll notice that I can keep going back and blending right on the same spot. Okay, so I'm going to finish that thought there. Okay, so that's what we're going to do is we're going to float all these little things. I'll slurp up a couple more, touch on my paper towel, a little bit of paint. I don't always have to reload. Sometimes I can just go right over here, get a little bit more water, and just use the paint that's on the palette. Okay, pick up a little bit more. And actually, I'm doing this um, incorrectly. You need to make sure that you are working from this direction back down towards yourself instead of up because doing it this way means that I'm going to run my brush through each one of these. So I'll need to just rotate this around and attack this end and work my way down first. Okay, now we're on to the other side. So I flipped it back around again. Load my brush, I'm running out of water drops. 
amazing how it can be freezing cold out, but I'm still, my, paint are, my paints are drying. So now I'm going to go and round that top corner and work my way around. Okay, and that'll give us some definition. Okay, then we're going to take our overs and unders. Okay, so what my suggestion to do is to go ahead and do all of one way's um, shadings. Okay, okay, so for example, I do that side of this little over guy, and then I move on to the next guy where I can tell. So the guy that's on top doesn't get shaded on, the guy that's underneath does. Okay, so he's crossing over these guys, so then you're going to shade here and here. This one is on top of these two, so we shade on top of those. Okay, so that's what you're going to do is just shade and shade, shade and shade, and then just move your way along the pattern. Okay, so this is as far as I've gotten so far. As I'm moving down to this littler area, I'm going to need to switch to my even smaller brush because it's even shorter and smaller and finer. So we'll switch to that and I'll just keep on going with my pattern. Okay, I got myself a little off track down in this area, but here's what I have to say. Is when that happens to you, just shade on the right sides that you should do. If you really get a bad square, just base out that square and fix it. But mostly there's so much going on over here that you can't really see, so I wouldn't, don't get yourself in too much of a tizzy about it. Um, and then if you have really strong pattern lines like that, grab out your eraser, which I will find mine, and, and erase them down before you start painting on them. Okay, now that I've got all my um, shading done, I want to shade the whole cornucopia. So I want to go with my color in a bigger brush. Oh, get you on camera, sorry. And we're going to do bigger floats just to make the whole thing kind of into a cohesive uh, item. Okay, so we're just going to glaze right to the edge. Make sure you get to the edge, otherwise you'll have like a halo around it. Okay, and that's just going to make it look a little bit more round as a basket itself. And every now and again, just kind of get back and squint to see if you're getting the shape and the form that you like. Okay. So notice that I'm not pushing on my brush. I'm not doing a, um, like, I'm not floating with my bristles way down like that. Super important um, to pay attention to stuff like that when you're watching videos and, and that kind of stuff is to watch how the hand is being held. And of course, it's my job to, to point that stuff out. So I'm just tickling and just guiding the edge of that brush along. If your brush is loaded well, then you're going to make a pretty stroke. Okay, so see how that's starting to take on some form. Okay, when you get to the opposite side, then what you'll do is you'll just go in where these things are sitting on top of them, on top of the basket, get all the way to the edge. And I just kind of am patting this paint into position and then I'll go over here and smooth it out. And when we go over on this part, we'll make the things that are going behind things into a little bit more blended look. Oops, let me go full circle there. And then I think it looks like this needs to have some bigger shading right back here. Some deeper, and we'll probably deepen this with some soft black. Okay, so that's starting to take on the right shape. Okay, next we're going to dry brush our highlights. So I'm just, I've got a mix of Camel plus Cocoa and I'm flicking on my paper towel so I don't have too much. And we're just going to do a dry C 
series of little scratches right up the middle. A little bit curved. This is going to get us in. Keep it more into the middle. And where the ones that are going underneath don't do them as long as the ones that are going on top. If that makes sense. And change your direction. So if this is weaving this way, you want to stroke this way. If it's weaving that way, you want to stroke that way. And make them uneven as well. And focus right up this middle channel. Okay, we're going to do the same thing with our basket here of the rim. Flick on that paper towel so you get rid of the strong stuff. And it's important that this stays kind of in that S-stroke kind of format, shape following. All right, now we're going to go with some soft black. And I got water. Keep your brush handles dry. Got water all over my handle and then I can't hang on to the brush right. So I'm going to use soft black just to make my shadow deeper down here at the bottom. And really just round that out. And then our shadow would be kind of deep over here. And just carry that down and around. And then definitely deep where things are going to be sitting in front. So I don't want it everywhere the same, but I want it a little bit everywhere. If you were painting this on a floor cloth, the way that you would manage it is, because you see how I'm turning my piece a lot, what you do is you roll up, um, which, uh, you roll up one side of your canvas, whichever way you're working, and then you can grab the roll and move it around and and stuff, you just kind of make it into a smaller piece. Okay, I think for right now we'll go ahead and call the basket done, and then we can, we can make more changes after um, we see how our colors are balancing out. Okay, because the triple threat will come off with varnish and all the things, I will use the triple threat to put on the lines so that I can remember that I'm supposed to be painting around these lines. And this so I lick my finger and the line comes right off. So really, really, really a safe way to mark your um, on top lines, if you will. Okay. Okay, the first thing we're going to do to our pumpkin is we're going to use our crescent brush with a little bit of paint on the end, dry it all off. This is called dry rubbing. We're rubbing and we're making it dry. So dry rubbing. And then we're going to get our highlights built using a uh, camel. This is a really easy way to get your highlights built on round objects is to do the dry rubbing. And you want your highlights to be highest in the front where our center of interest is and fading. But we still want to have them line up so that we are building you know that um, place where light hits kind of deal. And then we'll do it again but we'll concentrate more in the middle top. And so they kind of fade up. And then if I want to spread the love down here, I just go ahead and increase. These crescent brushes are phenomenal for this technique. They make the softest dry rubbing. Um, they just really do a simple, easy job of not having to have to float in the middle of something. I like to float and I love to do this. 
Okay, and so I think we'll leave that as high enough until I see what our shades and um, tints look like. All right, we're gonna do some dry rubbing to make our dark colors. I've got persimmon and a crescent brush. Not sure how I'm gonna like this, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start just a little casually here. I don't wanna overwhelm my pumpkin with too much orange. I'm not sure you can, but. So we know we're gonna have the strongest color right there. Now this is an area where you're not gonna to wanna to mess that inside up. So if you're going to, you could put a little piece of tape right there, or we could just float right in that section. Okay. And now we'll make it wider. I think that's a pretty good color. We definitely don't want to mess our outside edge up, so I'll bring that close, but not over. Isn't that just a fun way to shade? Remember, there's all that stuff that's going to be put in front here. We've got an apple, and actually, you know what? here's what we need to do. Let's go take a look and see where we need to focus. Okay, so in that lower area where I was just making things pretty, I've got an apple and all this stuff, so I want to make sure to get in that area, but not way down over here. Our grapes come over the front, so that's good. All right. Pumpkin doesn't need to be quite as defined as I was giving it credit for. And then we're going to go into a smaller brush and get into burnt sienna. It's like magically appearing before your eyes. Okay, then these back little sections right there get, they get colored just a little bit more. And we'll float to cinch that into the edge. And then repeating to increase the strength. Okay, now I've got my um, short bright, and I'm going to come over here. 
I'm just going to get right up next to that edge. Almost like a glaze float, real sheer, real watery. Glaze means that you wash colors over and um, it affects the, it changes the color under it instead of just laying on top of it. It actually just kind of um, does like staining or something like that where the, the paint that's already there will show through. getting pretty good. All right, as I'm base coating some of my um, the different colors, I want to make sure that um, everybody's aware when you're base coating, you want to turn your project around so that you can see the leading edge of your brush. So my face is cocked over that way and then I can see exactly where that brush is going. I was attempting to paint it the opposite way and it's really, really awkward and I flipped it over and I thought, hmm, not sure everybody would get that just yet. Like painting is one of those things where you build um, build your knowledge base and what works and doesn't work. But that's a real simple one and it's going to give you a lot, a lot more control. Okay, so I haven't base coated a lot of things lately. And I'm finding myself all hunched over on my painting table because normally I stencil things and that's how I get them based. So as I'm hunched over, I was like holding up my project so I could get a good angle and stuff. And then I remembered, you know what, I have... An artist buddy. So this has got this rubberized cloth on it and you can see that I have used it to, to know I've worn it out just about. Um, but so you can lock it so that it doesn't roll. It has adjustments down here for a bunch of different heights. Okay and then you lock it and then you just put your piece right on there and it holds it and now you can find yourself sitting back up or upright and not getting a backache while you're base coating. All right, I can already tell that I'm going to need to spread some of my red around. And so I think a really good time to do that is right now while I'm in base coat mode. So I'm going to deepen my pumpkin color up the side with the heritage brick. So see how that just gives it that lovely kind of cast. And then I think we can bring some heritage brick over here into our basket. Just a little kiss here and a little kiss there. And that's just going to be like, hmm, I wonder what's going on. Little hints of color. And we'll put some in our leaves. I don't want to make this a red project, but I definitely can tell just right off the bat that that that's going to make everything kind of cohesive. We can have a little bit of red back in our background. It's amazing what just little hints of color. We'll have some red in our grapes as well. All right, in order to um, keep my pattern on there so that I know where I'm going, um, I am going to float where my bends are with plantation pine just to keep my pattern there. So I'll just go ahead and plug all the little details. These um, artist buddies are actually made with hardwoods and stuff and they um, we have them designed for giant three foot um, square fireplace screens when I took a class with Mary Jane Todd or I hosted it at my studio in Portland and um, they also do um, really heavy things like um, stepping stones so they're very versatile 
Okay, so that's just marking my spot. I'll just finish the rest of these so that I have, um, then I can go on with my details and don't have to worry about my pattern. Okay, I'm going to take my plantation pine and my little crescent brush, and we're going to start creating some of the shading. Now we want to be careful not to mess up, mess up our finished items. So, but we don't care about going over our grapes and stuff. So we float next to things we don't want to mess up, and we dry rub next to things we don't care about. Start adding our form and our detail. I'll shade there. Draw this into the leaf just a little bit. I like to try to make painting as easy as humanly possible because there's no sense in working too hard. Just anybody could do this little scumbly technique. We're going to repeat our shading with black green in the deepest areas. So right here next to these leaves where things are going behind things. And don't drag it out as far as you had done the other. I think it's time to graduate to a new paper towel. poke some color here and there. All right, we're going to take some reindeer moss <clears throat> and we're going to do the same effect with this tiny little guy right here, right near our edges, and drag it back in. You know what? That wasn't reindeer moss. That was um, celery green. I'm going to keep our color straight. So I'll float next to the um, I'll float up next to the edge of the leaf and then I'll marry these two things together. Okay, so that looks a little bit like a band and so I don't want it to look like a band. So I want it to look like the tip is, is moving. So I'll soften that. Bring this out. Go into the reindeer moss. And that might just be on this one edge where it's really going to be a highlight. I'll do that on all the tips. Really be careful of this band type look. It needs to be kind of that whole leaf tip instead of just a band. If you ever can't make the color um, stay, try stippling it. Sometimes you get a tough spot. And just get as close as you can to the edge. Don't worry about getting all the way up there. Okay. 
Okay, the pumpkin stem is a little bit different. We're just going to go up the middle and then let it kind of have its little twists and turns. So maybe we won't connect everything. Okay, and we're going to do the um, this stem right here. It's going to have like three little leading chambers and we'll have it kind of knot around. We'll go into the reindeer moss. Increase. Okay, I've got that pretty much where I want it, and now I'm going to float. I've got a curved flat, which is a brush that is curved. Let's get you here. It's curved on this side and flat on this side, and it makes it into like an angled flat. It's not quite an angle brush. It has way more control. When I first saw it, I thought it was a gimmick. I tend to doubt everything. And um, then I actually tried it, and I should know better. I should always try first and then doubt. But um, yeah, I didn't want a new kind of brush, but boy, oh boy, do I love it. And see how you can just kind of glaze and walk the color around? It's pretty amazing stuff. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to just put this color right up next to the edges where I've dry rubbed. Scooch it right on in there. Okay, then we're going to go in and give a, just a little kiss, and I feel like this is going to be really strong. And use my little detail mop, blender mop, to soften. Just want to tip things, and that's going to leave harsh lines, so that's what the mop's for. Fingertips. Okay, this is where you want to look at your work and you want to squint, make sure that one thing isn't taken over another. messy or float messy and mop it clean. So over here where this um, leaves are kind of off in the distance or they're off to either side, we can make these brighter on the edges just so that they don't show as much. They're going to become more like the background. So that is another trick when you are wanting something to kind of sit back a little bit. You'll make it more like whatever it's near. If you want it to stand out more, then you put more contrast. They're getting kind of leafy looking. Okay, so we're going to shade on either side of our stem. And we're going to shade right down here at the bottom where it sinks in behind the little pumpkin. And I'll just chisel edge right on there. And I'll just lift onto my chisel and then I'm not getting very much paint. It's really versatile what you can do. This is a big brush, but if I take my brush this way, or if I take it this way, or if I take it this way, it becomes a much different brush each way that I turn it. Shade 
shade on either side where the stem comes behind. And then we'd go in and actually highlight that really strongly kind of right there. Let's just trail a little. I like that effect. I'm just using the back end of my brush and just trailing a little bit of the highlight down. And I'm actually wondering if I want to go into my leaves and just give them a puddlier look and leave a little bit of roughness. And so I'm just kind of slip slopping. I'll blend where I don't like it. I like the idea of having it a little teeny bit more painterly. So pity pat is a phrase we haven't used in a while. add some veining to our leaves with some thin celery. Try to let them flow just a little bit. If you start feeling like you're drawing like soldiers, stop. Okay. And we can draw a second vein line out. highlight that with a little reindeer moss where they need it. Okay, and so I've just done just a little teeny bit of, whoops, hi, that was strong, of highlighting. And I'm going to go down my pumpkin stem and just do some painterly highlighting. So just where you think you need just a little bit more brightness. It's okay to just do these randomly where you think you need to be. They don't have to go everywhere. And they don't really have to kind of line up. I mean, it'd probably be great if they did, but I'm mine aren't. The thing is, once you get so many little lines and stuff going, is what happens is you actually start distracting your viewer. You've got, I mean, we've got movement and clipping tails and all this. Now, if I studied it and I got in there and I counted like how many of these went this way and how many went that way, sure, you could pick out some, some mistakes. But um, for the casual everyday viewer that's just going to take in the whole picture, they will not see your mistakes as much as you think they will. So take heart because it's not not as bad as it seems like it is when you're giving presents and and all that kind of stuff. As I'm sitting here and I'm trying to um, conceptualize what I'm doing, I know that I, I think I know that I want some checks, but I don't know if I do or not. So I'm going to do a little testing and stuff like that. But I wanted to introduce you to this wonderful stencil. It is um, a banding stencil, so it goes from 1 16th all the way up to 1 inch checks. So you can just lay that puppy right on your edge, stencil your checks, they're pre-measured, they're all accurate, it's wonderful. We've got a number of these different banding stencils, so many things laying around here. And so the variations are just limited by what you need. So we've got rectangles in different widths, we've got diamonds, we've got tall diamonds, we've got wide diamonds, we've got all the things. So if you need banding stencils, and one of my favorites is the straight line. Nope, that's a. This one is a set of tiny banding stencils that go up to a bigger size. 
but there's one that just does straight bands and I'll have to find it it's laying underneath something sitting here but so when I get ready to put my band of whatever on here I'll be able to just use the straight line band instead of taping and so I can just go straight line all the way around easy 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 okay we're going to do the grapes and I don't have a grape stencil cut for this because at some point buying stencils specifically for every project is going to be kind of crazy so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my grape overlay stencil for my um, grape project so any one that has the right size and I've got a bunch of different sizes here so I'm going to use my different size grapes and custom customize my stenciling so we want to we want to highlight I'm going to go into wild orchid and fall down maybe I'll go a little bit smaller and I'm going to do the smaller brush. So we'll go into crescent brushes. Sorry about that. The neat thing about the crescent brushes is they get down to itty bitty sizes. So we can line it up with my edge. And what I like about this is this just makes the grapes so much faster to do. I'll go into my shading brush. Well, I've got this in place. I'm going to need a piece of tape. Yep, that's what I thought. Okay. I'll get relined up. Two pieces of tape. I will be making this work because I don't want to have to float the, around every little edge of all these grapes. Call it laziness, call it whatever you like. Oops. Okay. And now I think I need a smaller shading brush. These are smaller, um, smaller than the ones that I did on the plaque, if you follow any of this stuff. So I'll go in with our shade with the grape juice color. And just shade around the edges. Really, we're making this into a mask. And we'll repeat with a little deep midnight. Take a little sneak peek. And voila, we have grape. Okay, so now we'll just repeat with whatever grapes fit wherever we're at. And we'll keep our brushes wet and just go back and forth between the colors and just start building our grapes. see how fast that goes like that much better okay so here are the grapes that I did with the stencils that's the stencil that I'm using and see that I've got some blue and some purple so you'll do some of your grapes with the midnight blue shade and some of them with the grape juice shade and that's going to be the difference in those colors and you'll build from the back and build your way up to the middle okay now once you get to where you've got grapes laying down in the middle then you can go ahead and just use the grape overall and we'll just go ahead and kind of fill the grape up um, and then we'll put our top ones very systematically. Okay, when you get to one that has stuff painted under it, then just go ahead and just dry rub on a base coat and then you can go about your business as usual. Okay, so I've got all my little grapes done and I ended up with some little spaces where I didn't have um, a good um, fill-in, if you will. I couldn't get at it or whatever. So I'll just go in and dry brush if I can get that thing to do that, which it's not. I'll just go in and give it a little bit of a float. And just to darken the little valleys right there. Anywhere where things didn't line up. 
Okay, now we'll go make the magic happen because now we get to put the, the top stuff on. Now these brushes have got Mondo dried paint in them and I'll show you how I take care of that in a little bit. Right now I'll just flip them in some water. Okay, so let's go put some highlights in our top grapes with a little bit of our Indian turquoise. Just to give them that little bit of a different look. That lifts those forward. We'll get out our short bright. And anything that needs to be deeper or darker or you know just really show an edge better. And go ahead now this is where we'll float. When I've got the Payne's gray on my brush. side here. Okay, and I'll squint and look. See what I'm thinking about. If we need some of them glazed a little bit more purple, we could do that. Now we'll float our sea stroke with, um, let me check and see what color I want. Okay, we're going to add our sea strokes on our top grapes. I'm not liking this brush for this. Okay, I got out a small curved flat. It's just going to allow me to tuck in, do what I want to do. It's interesting that angle brushes can just really make that big a difference. Okay, so we'll grab the top guys. Now I'll give it its nice little highlight. Gives us our nice round looking grapes. We can add a couple more highlights, the ones you can't quite see the base of. Okay, and then we're going to shade under the grapes with Payne's Gray. Stay off of your grape. Let's give us a little bit more separation. Curved flat brush is remarkable for this. Okay, see how much more pop that gives them? Helps if you stay in the lines. I'm 
completely out of water here. Okay. Dry floats do not do anybody any good unless they need to be dry. We'll call those puppies done. Okay, I don't quite think I got my pumpkin dark enough. So we're going to deepen it while we are in this area. And I've got out some Q-tips. These are super sharp little, um, real hard Q-tips, um, or swabs, I guess. Really tightly wound so that they can get in to little tight areas. Okay. And so what I'll do is I'll just go in and float, tucking color where I want it, just being real gentle about it. Should have done this deeper before, so when you're painting, go ahead and make it deeper with your dry rubbing, which will be much easier. Apparently I've already mopped with that finger. Get on in there. Okay, and so I think we'll come over here and deepen that. And then we're going to come up this edge and walk on in there. And then I'll use the clean side of that brush to mop things up a little bit. And I'll get out my blending mop, which I should have had out before. That's making me much happier. Okay, so see where I've got it on the leaf? Let's go take that off the leaf. I'm just kind of shading right on this side, almost like drop shadow, to indicate like that that leaf is lifted up away. And that really ought to be pretty strong. Like it. You can really finesse with that brush. Okay, let me get my this is Susan locked. And now let's add a little bit more highlights to our um, raised parts of our pumpkin with camel. And then we'll go camel plus white. And pumpkins are hard and shiny, or can be hard and shiny, so we want to make sure we give it that reflective kind of highlight. Squinting, squinting, squinting. 
this is bugging me right up there. Do you see how that's not shaded very much? I think it could use just a touch more shade, but I don't want to get it really dark. So I'm just going to go ahead and use that heritage brick. Okay. Okay, I'm going to deepen that pumpkin just a little bit more on the edge with antique maroon. Walk it in in that corner. Okay, I like that better. And then we'll do the same thing down below. I just realized that I left my little highlighting brush out and it is hard, hard, hard. So I'm going to show you how I clean my brushes, especially when I do something silly like leave my brushes out or I'm doing the dry rubbing and the, the buildup happens. So I'm going to use the Winsor Newton Brush Cleaner and Restorer. This actually has a different label now on the website. And it is, um, this is pretty special stuff. It's non-toxic, biodegradable, water-soluble, non-flammable, non-abrasive, low vapor. The only bad thing about it is it doesn't like things like uh, styrofoam. It will eat right through your styrofoam. So do not put your styrofoam meat tray on your antique piano because, and then use this because it will eat through it and get into your, your finish. So watch what happens here. Now this is really hard brush. I'm going to put it in here and it will immediately release the paint. It is just, it will save you so much money and you will, the life of your brushes will be extended and it is just a miracle. And it's got these little, this is a brush groomer, it's got these little scrubby things that you can run your ferrule through. And then you just wash in water and so I'll pull out one of these other guys that I had sitting in the water. And so it's not hardened, but you can see that I've got purple paint up there. That will release all of that. And then my brushes will be soft and supple for the next time I want to dry rub. So just a perfect brush cleaner. Um, I haven't seen another brush cleaner on the market that cleans as well. Especially not that's not toxic and awful for you. All right, we're going to find a paper towel. I ran the last one through my paint. I'm going to increase some of our green darknesses with um, black green. So I'm just going to kind of cup down and around the stem. Get my mop in action here. Some places where things are going behind the things. And then mop it smooth. This little rim right here. And this little guy down here shouldn't be as bright as he is. He's behind everything. He's underneath. Kind of wash him down. Same thing here. Well, 
It helps if you do it well. I fight turning my piece. I need to turn my Lazy Susan on, but I don't like the noise that it makes on camera and stuff. It seems distracting, so I'm doing it manually. But I'll fight turning my piece, and that is like the kiss of death. You want to be going in the right direction with your project. So make sure you turn your piece. That is the easiest way to become a better painter that I know of. So now what we're doing is we're building our contrasts. So this guy back here, everything's kind of blending together. So let's unblendify it. Right back here, this should be pretty much dark. Further with this down here. And this leaf needs to be shaded back there on the curl edge for roundness. Okay, for my apple, I'm going to mix camel and coral shell together. I'm wanting a little bit of a orangey kind of color, but I don't want it too orange, too pink. So I'm just going to have to mix it, I guess. Okay, so then let me look at my pattern. Things flying everywhere. So my pattern shows that I'm going to have my little smile over here. So I'll just sketch that on. So what I'm going to start with is I'm going to start with my float to um, to give me some depth in that little, um, I'll start over. So I'm going to get some depth. <laughs> Go this direction. We'll float the shade in. And then maybe we'll go ahead and just float our edges Definitely not enough water here. See why I like to dry brush or dry rub? Because look at how stripey that is. But I'm going to go ahead and get next to my edge. That way I can go ahead and dry rub without having a bullseye painted. Okay, I'm going to start marking my banding. I need to know how big my, where to lay out my word. Um, and I've got a thing called a half pipe compass. And this is really, really a unique little guy. So normally the compasses, they sit in your brush box and if you have them upright, then you can get stabbed by that little vicious weapon right there. But this comes with a cap to keep it safe. Okay, so you can carry it with you and have it, and it snaps on really well. It's not gonna just fall off. It's got a padded grip and then you just move this open and you hold it back here on this handle so then you line up where you want and you can take a mark instead of measuring um, like we do you know with rulers and t-squares and all that kind of stuff this is pre-squared and so you can just easily mark your banding Oops, if you keep your compass in the right position that works okay so then I can open it wider to get my other banding. But the really unique thing, um, one time I taught a class in Portland. Um, for those of you who've heard this before, I'm sorry that it's a repeat, 
but I had taught a class in Portland where we were doing floor cloths and I needed to have my compass and I ran out of lead and I couldn't find any I went to 12 stores and now we carry the lead on the website just because of that so that um, it's a very difficult thing to find because it's a drafting tool and so anyway this has a lead reservoir on the back of your compass so you can have multiple leads in there and it all stores right on board and it just fits into your brush base or into your brush container it's easy easy cheesy all right I'm gonna go ahead and get my letters stenciled on so that I can make sure that I'm liking what I'm seeing I'm gonna use um, oh, I'm gonna use heritage brick not jump in the gun there and I'm gonna use my big dome brush and I'm going to dry it off really well and I'm going to scumble So you'll get a completely different effect if you stipple with heavy paint and what that will do is it will make it very dark and very strong and that's not the look I'm looking for here. Right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to untape this and I want to peek and make sure that I like the color. I think that'll be good. Okay, so we'll just keep loading with the Heritage Brick. Heritage Brick is a neat color. I haven't used it very much. That's kind of neat to discover a new, a new favorite color. Because it's just brownish enough and just reddish enough to be a good deep red without being obnoxious. Don't have too much time for the obnoxious reds. I'm just scumbling over it. Isn't this a fast, fun technique? It's not hard work. No tracing, no basing. You know, the, the odds of you actually finishing a project using a stencil is much bigger, much greater. Okay, so now I'm not sure what I want to do about these leaves here. In theory, this should be a green line, but then I kind of don't like the idea of it being a green line. So maybe we'll just start it red and finish it something else. We'll see what happens. Okay, now I'll go back and pick up anything that didn't really get dark. And then I'm going to go into my antique maroon color and we're going to darken from the top down. That halfway. Maybe we'll go lower on that side since it's an arching kind of situation. Yeah, that's that's a neat idea. Okay, and then next we want to deepen that with some. Hmm. Okay, we'll deepen that with some soft black at the top. Okay, then we'll switch brushes and we'll go into maybe, 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 maybe a little bit of this mix that we're putting the highlight on the apple with, which was coral shell and camel. like this or not. Too much paint.
All right, time to peek. Okay, that's pretty sharp looking. Okay, now we'll do our leaves. The leaves are going to be done in the green, so I'm going to get those out. All right, we're going to do our light avocado. And do our greens. Might have to get a little bit more base cutty with these because they're transparent, so a little heavier paint. I think I might want that band to be green. We'll see when I get these base coated. Yeah, that looks really silly, so base coat away. All right, and we'll go with plantation pine. I think we'll make it darker up there through the middle. And then just to make the shading and everything easier, let's see if I can get you somewhere where you can see, I'm just going to go ahead and just dry rub into my leaf middles. And then I'll highlight the tips with my, um, my highlight greens. Same thing on this side. So we'll get you over here. I've got my same highlights as I used for my um, greens down here. So just do those edges. And then we'll go into the reindeer moss. just a little highlight on the edge of my details. All right, let's see what we look like. Okay. So that's where we're going. And now let's go ahead and add, we need to do some drop shading. Okay, I've got Mississippi mud and charcoal mixed together. Now I'm going to add water. Blot my brush. You want it thin, want that transparent kind of thing going on. Okay, and then you're going to flatten your your round out. Okay, and this is really funny. I can't do this on top of this because I've got the wrong glasses. I have to be able to see. Okay, that's a better angle for me. So we're going to do all of these sides. And that just really beats up the lettering. It just adds so much. You want to blot so that you're not leaving these little drip lines. And I think on this one, I am going to go ahead and just base in my bridging on my stencil. Usually I don't, but I think it's because it's so dark, it's really, um, like the color that I chose is so dark, it's really showing. And I don't want it to really show. 
Okay, now we're going to go and get our apple redded up. So I'll do the Heritage Brick color and get right on next to that edge. And if you can't get all the way next to the edge, like I'm not being able to do, we'll just float it again once we get it darkened. And then we'll get another brush. You definitely want to get a set of crescent brushes because you don't want to ever have to not be able to move on to the next um, the next project, the next area, I guess. And I'm going to mix some of my Heritage Brick in with that highlight color because that's just a little too bright for the first, first strike there. Okay, getting a little shine going. Now I'll go straight into that highlight mix of Coral Shell and Camel. Dry enough to go. You can dig a big old fat hole if you're not careful. Okay, we'll go one more. And really concentrate that in that little area right there. You don't want that to get too high and then take over for everything else. Now I'll go into my Antique Maroon, get on next to there, and I'll repeat one time with the Antique Maroon. Now I'm going to do a little scary dangerous thing, I'm going to have my Q-tip in my hand and I'm going to go right over this leaf tip to get that nice and shaded right there. I'll spit and wipe. Okay, it's a really great little technique. And then we'll go once into soft black. Now notice that I'm not washing my brush out or using a different brush for each color, which is meaning that my brush is going to have a little bit of each color in it, and that's going to make the colors really blend well. Okay, so for roundness, once again, I'll just go right over that low leaf tip and go back in and clean it up. Okay, I'll get that little bit of highlight that would be around the back there. Okay, I'll take my highlight and my curved flat and just give me a little strong highlight there at the throat. And then I'll float with my soft black and a little bit of, so like a mix of antique, antique maroon with soft black. Oops, and a puddle. And that'll just cinch that edge nicely. A little deeper at the bottom. Okay. All right, we're going to carry some red around because I think we need it. So I'm going to go into, maybe we'll go into the Antique Maroon, and we'll bring this red into this area here, and be prepared to mop. I think we can bring some red into our leaves. God. I think I can bring it into like the body of the leaf. Okay, 
here. Definitely in our basket. Definitely more down over here in our basket. And on our grapes. Okay, just bringing those colors in everywhere together, it just carries like all the things around. It's a really good idea to kind of bring your glazes in. Okay, can't forget these guys right near our apple. Did this, but I can't tell that I did it, so I'll go back with some more. Okay, so that that gives everybody a little smooch with the color. And see why this is easier for me to paint. Um, I really, 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 really wanted this to be a floor cloth, um, but on camera, flipping things around and keeping it all contained in this little rectangle space is just about impossible. So I kind of get stuck where I can't do the big format things, at least not on camera. Okay, so we'll glaze these leaves up here. Just a little bit of something going on. Give them a little bit more weight. All right, I want to get a little bit deeper back here. So I'm going in with soft black. here. Okay, that just gives us a little bit more sunken look. Let's go in and clean up the edges of our cornucopia. Increase the contrast. We can go ahead and increase the contrast back here. Let's take just a little of our, um, a little bit of our mix colors and give ourselves a little stem and a little cap. And we'll just call that done. All right, so I've got this based with a mix of charcoal and light avocado. And now I want to shade my inside framed art area. So I've got some asphaltum and a great big brush with a lot of water in it. 
Okay, I'm not going to worry about my green band. Base coats are easy to fix. Got to get it cinched up next to my edge, and I need a big old mop. Okay, we need to start just sinking that down. Keep my clean edge out. Lots of water, almost sloppy with it. Okay, we'll go right along the base, over in that corner. Okay, wait, wait for that to dry, and then we'll give it a little bit deeper shading. Okay, now I think I'm going to spit out, let's see, now I think we'll just go with Esbaldum one more time. Let's see what that does for us. Maybe a little drier. The benefit of being a little bit too wet is that things will float out and you want a little bit of floating out. And you always mop from the clean into the dirty and wipe off on your paper towel. Next, what I want to do is I want to use my chicken wire stencil. And actually, what I'll do is I'll lay it right on my edge so that I track it straight. And I want to just go ahead and do a little tone on tone chicken wire. I'll get it mostly close to my edge. I'm not going to worry too much about it. I've mixed um, charcoal and plantation pine. Two charcoals to one plantation pine. Okay, I'm going to test out my banding stencil. I'm using the 1 8 line. And I'm going to have it slightly bridge my border and my, um, my band. I'm going to try burnt sienna first. I'm wanting to bring a little bit of that orange all the way around. Okay, so I don't like that, so I'm going to try my French Grey Blue. And I also don't want to sit here and pounce this, so I'm just going to do the dry rub. to move to a piece of tape here. Okay, let's take a look. Yeah, I think I can dig that better, and I think I can do some fun things with my accent colors. Oh, you know what? I went the wrong way. Crap. Okay, so here's what we know. When you make big, fat mistakes like that, now this might take off my shading over here. I'm trying to decide which way I want to go with this. Let's go the opposite way. I'm going to dip my eraser in water and see if I can't erase this orange band. A wet eraser will remove your um, freshly dried paint. A dry eraser will not. Okay, so I did get a little bit into my band there, but that's okay because um, I'm going to put the band on top as of my blue mistake there. There, so problem fixed. Okay, let's try not to do that again. Okay, so then I'll line that up and continue.
Okay, take a look at how awesome. Let's see. Whoops. These lines are amazing. Just absolutely amazing. So, big fan already of these little banding dudes here. What I've learned is don't let the end extend past where you want the paint because it doesn't make a very crisp corner. Definitely learned that I like the control I get with the dry rubbing. I love that I have all of these banding options on my stencil. I love that it's reusable. I love that I'm not throwing away a pile of tape. This is cool stuff. Control the amount of paint you have so you don't get bleeding. That, look at how perfect that is. Okay, so I'm doing this cross-hatching pattern, or you could call it a candy cane pattern. Whichever way you want to call it. It can be used for either or. I'm doing Indian turquoise. And I am loving this kind of stroke work. More than anything, I think I love, like I like stroke work very much and I like that it's relaxing and stuff like that. I hate the stress that people that don't like stroke work have when they are doing projects. So I love that this is a little bit more user friendly. If you like the old fashioned way and you want to do strokes, do strokes. This is just nice and measured and easy to do. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to do some burlap. Oops. Yeah, burlap. And I'm really making sure to brush in from my edges. I don't want, without tack it over and over on the bottom of my stencil, um, I don't want to end up with a big, big bleedy mess. And then I'll have to go back over that. So I'll brush down and away from the edge of the stencil. are lovely checks. Okay, so this little checking system is going brilliantly. I was able to base coat my whites and then go back and base coat exactly my um, black, uh, soft black. It's just brilliant. So, and just laying it over and doing it. Now, the one thing I didn't do, and I'll have to go back and fix it, is I didn't start my corners right. I started kind of in the middle just to see how well it would work and then, yeah. So I jacked that up, but um, very fixable, and I'm telling you so that you don't make the same mistake. Okay, so I messed up with how far in I brought my band over here. So I'm going to use my banding stencil instead of tape to fix that. Oops, didn't want to be blocking there. So I didn't quite get it base coated enough, so I'll just base coat in between that chicken wire. There we go. Okay, and finally I'm going to use this um, 1 16th banding line down around. The key is, is to get it as close to that as possible, and I'm using persimmon, and I'm just scumbling in my bands. What I'm liking about this, I'm not having absolutely any problem getting them lined up. I'm not really having problems bleeding. If I'd aligned up my corners right in the beginning, that would have been much better. But besides just a novice mistake, this has been really easy to line up all the things. That little piece of tape is very helpful. I want to take a little bit of my Indian turquoise and kind of spread it around on a few of these externally leaves. Don't like that I'm kind of isolating that color. 
And then I want to take a little bit of my persimmon and just give a little bit of a color boost to the base. Yeah, so that gives it like an orange look without it being orange. And then I think I'm going to go ahead and bring a little bit of that persimmon into the leaves. A little bit back here on the basket. Even though I brought it into the band, it, I think it just could use just a little bit more. Let's bring that color around. I think bringing it up into the leathers is a really good idea. That helps a lot. Oops, hi. Line up your stencil right. I was just getting ready to film my intro, which I always do at the end, and I decided that the corners of this blue band needed to be just kind of sunk in just a little bit. So I'm just doing a little glaze wash over it just to sink them in using Midnight Blue. Okay, our last step is going to be finishing. I'm going to use this great big giant Mod Podge brush because look at how fast my varnishing is going to go. I'm using Ultra Matte Varnished, varnish from DecoArt. And I'm on my nonstick mat, so I don't care if I get that over the edge or not. I just want to go fast, with big long strokes, to get it coated before it dries. And I'm going to show you how to make this something that will stand up to the duress of drinks and serving and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to treat this one more step after my varnish. Okay, after I have a couple coats of varnish on there and I'm all dry, I'm going to apply Clapham Salable Wax. This is going to make an impervious um, finish for my tray. That means I can spill on it, I can slop on it, and the things will be wiped off. You can use this on the tops of your floor cloths as well. Don't put it on the bottom because you don't want it slippery. Um, but you can definitely um, protect all of your surfaces with the Clapham Salable finish. Well, the way you do it is you're just going to use a paper towel and you're just going to take a little bit and you're going to apply it with little round buffing strokes. You're going to set it aside and you're going to let it dry for a day or two. And then once it's dry, you're going to buff it with either steel wool or a dry paper towel and you're going to have the most remarkable finish that you've ever had and it's going to be food safe. It's going to be impervious to the elements like um, sloppy eaters or tray carriers and um, it's just going to be, it's going to protect everything and it's the perfect finish for a tray.